uh, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, this is very much a team effort. Um, I was involved with a group, uh, the people listed on this uh, title uh, screen. And uh, Dave Anderson was um, leading the charge with um, scientific technical expertise on EVM. Uh, Matthew Piper was involved uh, doing a lot of the uh, communication, setting up the uh, actual dialogue sessions and communicating with a lot of the people who uh, attended the event. Uh, Jules Labouf uh, was the facilitator and um, helped to uh, make the dialogue sessions a success. And then I was involved uh, mainly um, as the researcher uh, and uh, today I'll be presenting you uh, results of uh, research from these dialogue sessions on EBM in Alberta. Uh, so just a few quick words about the research. Uh, this project started around January 2017 uh, and we finished up uh, most of our work by December uh, 2017. So it was about a 12-month uh, initiative uh, for this group. Uh, and this is uh, very new material, so we're just finishing up the final project report, which should be available soon. Uh, and we've given a version of this presentation just once before at the Healthy Landscapes Activity Team in April. So, uh, so you're really getting um, the newest uh, information from this uh, project, and you're some of the first people to to see these uh, these slides and to see these results. So I'm going to turn off my video camera so I don't distract you um, or myself and then move into uh, the presentation from here. Uh, so just a quick comment on the actual title. Can people change in a day? The question is uh, front and center here. And it, it's kind of, for me, it's a play on uh, the question of, you know, what is the purpose of dialogue? Uh, why are we... Um, focused on public dialogue in this context. And um, typically when we think about uh, change, social change and personal change, um, we imagine and we assume that change will take a lot of time and uh, a single day of discussion uh, may not have a big impact on how people think or feel about uh, the, the topic of, of EBM in Alberta, but it does present a potential starting point. And so one thing that I'm going to show you in the presentation today is a little bit of um, insight into how people were changed, um, how um, in, in, in aggregate the, the participants uh, were affected by the dialogue and how their perception of EBM shifted to some extent uh, because of their single day uh, deliberation on this topic. So going to go into the next slide here, which uh, focuses on the goals of the uh, project. Uh, so starting with the initial idea, we had a sense um, coming from the work that David Anderson does, as well as um, many others in, in the world or the field of EBM, that there are, uh, is a lot of enthusiasm for concepts of, of EBM in in Alberta, but there's also quite a lot of resistance. Uh, and we were trying to understand through this project, um, what are the sources, what are the underlying causes of uh, resistance to implementing EBM within Alberta? Another way to think about it is to identify the kind of pinch points or the areas where we could see um, People are struggling with the concept where competing ideas are present, and we wanted to try and understand that uh, much more deeply than uh, we, um, we felt we knew going into the project. So that was one goal. The second goal was to try and uh, test out a particular way of, of talking to people, talking to each other, uh, through this dialogue uh, on EBM. Uh, so we're trying to, to do dialogue in a different way uh, and to explore how researchers and practitioners, policymakers, uh, environmental organizations, and other stakeholders could move forward uh, together um, to try to move past some of these, um, these challenges in implementing EBM 
in Alberta. So these are some of the goals uh, that really uh, provided direction for our project. So if we move to the, um, the actual dialogue sessions themselves, maybe uh, some of you uh, on this webinar were invited or participated uh, and you received uh, these uh, information materials uh, through your organizations. And you can see the way in which we structured the invitation. Um, it was really trying to focus on uh, hearing from people, to hear from uh, people who come into the room to learn collectively from each other. Uh, the goal was not to try to correct people's views, not trying to teach or educate. It wasn't a technical workshop. Um, it was very much um, a, a desire to see uh, where people were coming from to to learn from their experiences about EVM in the province and to hopefully collectively move forward on our understanding of EVM. So we had four sessions throughout Alberta. The first one was in Athabasca. Uh, that was the smallest of the sessions. It allowed us to test out um, some of our methods for dialogue. Uh, and then we uh, also had sessions in Grand Prairie. Uh, in Calgary, and then the final se session in December in Edmonton was our largest session. Uh, and since then, we've been working on um, analyzing the results of the work. A little bit more on the methods that we used. Uh, so uh, two, two methods I'll kind of focus on here. Um, the dialogue itself used a fishbowl technique. And you can see this uh, fishbowl idea in the picture, uh, the photograph there, um, as well as in the uh, figure where we have uh, seats in the middle of the room and we invite people uh, to come and sit in the middle of the room and to talk to each other about uh, EBM. Uh, and then the people on the outside of that, those middle seats have an opportunity to listen. Um, and then um, at some point after listening for a while, uh, we break out into a larger conversation, talk about what people heard, what they didn't hear, um, and then there's opportunity to refresh the participants in the middle where other people could come and sit down and have that conversation. So you can see through the, the course of the day, there were sort of seven sort of segments of dialogue through the day. Um, at the beginning of the day, uh, David Anderson presented uh, a general overview of EVM. Um, and in that overview, uh, again, not a technical kind of session on EVM, but really more of a high level uh, focus on principles. So we looked at the, he's presented his sort of principles of EVM. Um, and after that, um, that presentation, we moved into this fishbowl fish dialogue. So, um, a large part of the day was really spent in conversation with each other. Um, and these short presentations were designed to really seed the conversation, to set the stage for the dialogue. Um, so we had a fishbowl session in the morning. Um, and then in the afternoon, uh, David Anderson also uh, went through a very high level uh, EBM scenario. Uh, which set the stage for another fishbowl conversation in the afternoon. And that was really the main structure uh, of the day-long dialogue. So in, in terms of res the research itself, uh, we recorded the discussion almost verbatim. So I was uh, in the room uh, writing down what people were saying and uh, others were also taking notes. So we have a lot of information from the dialogue itself and I'll be presenting uh, some of the observations from those dialogue um, sessions. And then the second thing we did was uh, we conducted pre and post dialogue online surveys. Uh, and so these surveys also provide us with uh, results that I'll share. Um, today in the presentation, and these surveys indicate uh, what people were thinking about EBM, how they were thinking about EBM, and, and their thoughts on the dialogue itself before the dialogue actually took place. And then we asked uh, the same questions again after the dialogue uh, to see if their views had changed at all 
um, as a result of their experience uh, through that one day dialogue session. So moving into uh, some of the results then, uh, we can see that uh, the diverse, there is quite a bit of diversity in the participation. Uh, we can see um, quite a large number of people from the forest industry uh, in attendance. We also had uh, a large representation from environmental groups, uh, consultants, the provincial government, federal government, educational institutions, indigenous organizations, and so on. In total, there were uh, 80 dialogue participants over the four sessions, and uh, 50 of those participants completed a pre and post uh, questionnaire. Uh, so we have about a 60% um, particip participation rate within the survey itself. So uh, looking at some of the results from the survey, uh, looking at the question of uh, how likely someone might be to recommend ecosystem-based management on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is the most likely or highly likely to recommend, and one is not likely to recommend. You can see the scale on the x-axis and the percentage of respondents on the y-axis. And the pre-dialogue on the left shows um, fairly high likelihood. So the lowest um, respondent was five out of 10, um, and the, the highest number of respondents uh, indicated 10 out of 10. So very likely to recommend EBM um, in the pre-dialogue uh, questionnaire. And then you can see in the post-dialogue questionnaire a shift to the left. So now we have some respondents who are indicating a two, three, or five out of 10. Um, and you can see a lot fewer people in the 10 out of 10 category. So more people in the nine out of 10 category after the dialogue session. So likelihood to recommend uh, dropped here. Um, and this is not surprising to us. Um, in fact, uh, this could be a desirable outcome, arguably from a, a dialogue perspective. Um, and one reason I say that is that um, people who come into a room, you can imagine, have a sense of what EBM is. Through the course of a day, uh, listening to each other, um, listening to presentations, uh, there's a recognition that um, EBM is understood and implemented in very diverse kinds of ways. EBM has different meanings for people. Um, and, I could, and one could imagine that people feel a little less clear about uh, what version of EBM is being presented and a little bit less supportive of recommending EBM in a general sense. Um, so it, one could say that, you know, uh, um, a likelihood to recommend dropping after the dialogue suggests that we that more people are a little more kind of reticent or confused or understanding of the diversity of views around EBM um, after the dialogue itself. Um, so likelihood to recommend dropped, um, but in some of these other um, measures, so this is in in response to the statement, I gained an appreciation for other perspectives through the dialogue session. We can see that about 85% of participants, respondents to the survey agreed to this. They did gain uh, perspectives from others. Um, so we're quite pleased with this outcome. This is one indicator that the dialogue session was successful in terms of our goals of uh, gaining uh, insights from diverse points of view on the topic of EBM in Alberta. Uh, if we look at uh, this next statement uh, in response to the statement, uh, responses from participants, um, overall, this dialogue session was a good use of my time. Again, about 80% of people uh, agreed that uh, this, this session, this day-long dialogue was a good use of their time. And this insight, uh, is important to us partly because uh, when we asked one of another question in the survey, uh, 
whether they thought they were going to hear from um, from us more technical information. They did expect to see more technical information. Um, they did not get technical information um, from the session as they expected, uh, but they still felt like uh, the dialogue um, and the time spent was um, was worth their time. So I'm going to shift now from the survey observations from the survey results to the dialogue observations. I'm going to come back to survey results again a little later in the presentation, uh, but I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the, the observations from dialogue themselves. And so uh, in, in this section, I'll, I'll uh, share three slides. Uh, the first one on technical observations, then some philosophical observations, and then relational observations. So we move to the technical observations. Uh, these insights are um, coming mainly from uh, Dave Anderson's uh, perspective on how people were dealing with and responding to some of the technical aspects of EBM. And you can see here there's a tendency to think of EBM as an outcome and not a process. And some examples of this are when we hear from people, um, they're concerned about outcomes like edge density or linear disturbance, and then others who are concerned about uh, too many assumptions and not enough details within the scenarios that were presented. Um, and then still others who found uh, scenario details a bit overwhelming. Um, so it did appear that the capacity to engage on technical details uh, was kind of all over the map. Some people were looking for more kinds of technical insights. Other people felt like there was too much technical information um, and it was a little overwhelming to them. And so this is uh, one of the insights in terms of this sort of variation in te technical and scientific capacity and a need for sort of more kind of learning together around some of these technical insights uh, in order to move the EBM con conversation forward. Um, but this, these, um, these insights were not really the big issue, like technical concerns, scientific concerns around EBM were not, uh, not the, the main concerns that we observed within the dialogue. Um, we had an assumption going into these EBM dialogue sessions that technical issues would dominate the dialogue, that people would be engaging in technical um, uh, conversations, but this really was not so much the case. We did observe some, some of these um, sort of technical issues, but um, more than that, we observed um, other kinds of challenges, um, other other barriers that really seem to be more front and center uh, with regard to implementing EBM in Alberta. So let me say a few words about philosophical observations. Uh, this is really a, a slide that focuses on the link between EBM and values and questions about how values fit into um, the implementation of ecosystem-based management. So uh, on one hand, we can see that people really supported EBM's focus on disturbance, ecosystem structure and function. So for the most part, the idea of a focus on disturbance, structure and function was not a problem. People accepted this uh, quite clearly. And this, this figure that I'm showing you on the right uh, where climate is at the top, and then you go down to disturbance patterns, you go to landscape conditions, and you move all the way down to the bottom where values come out the bottom. This is how the concept of EBM was sort of presented uh, in, the, in the workshop where values are kind of an outcome of the disturbance patterns on the landscape. Uh, and a lot of people really pushed back on that. They really wanted to sort of insert questions around values or ideas around values much more front and center within the planning process to say we need to start from values and then move through the planning process where values are really guiding the decision making. 
And so this was a clear tension in a number of the dialogues uh, that took place. And one way to interpret what's going on here is to, uh, is to examine the way in which concepts of sustainable forest management are very deeply embedded in the way we think about um, how forest management is done. And so I, in the little box here, I've given a quote by Adamovich and Burton, which is from a, a big book that was published out of the Sustainable Forest Management Network, where they really kind of define the concept of state sustainable forest management as a values-based conversation here. They say the final and ultimate stage in forestry is the social stage, which um, environmentally sound forestry satisfies diverse social needs. And if you read through that, that book uh, on SFM, you can see that values are really kind of a driving concept there. It's the way in which criterion indicators of sustainable forest management are set up. So uh, one way to think about this tension is really a tension between uh, the concept of the philosophy of sustainable forest management versus the philosophy of EBM, which kind of shifts the way in which, or is inviting us to shift the way in which we think about uh, ideas of values and where they fit into the planning process. The last uh, area or observation is relational. Um, so here we can see that in, through the dialogue, Participants expected a traditional workshop style um, where they would listen to experts in the field of ABM. This is what our pre-survey indicated to us, that they were expecting a kind of workshop. Um, they didn't get that. Um, the dialogue was really, for many, a very new way of um, engaging with people, and it seemed to be um, accepted. You know, people appreciated what, what was done there. Um, there was op opportunity for trust building. And I'll show you some results which really show the way in which trust did kind of shift um, after the dialogue took, took place. And there also seemed to be an appreciation for uh, the neutrality of the sponsors. We really tried to set ourselves up as sort of neutral um, um, uh, facilitators of this session where we really wanted to, uh, we desired to hear people from diverse points of view and try to facilitate a process where these diverse views could be heard within the room. So let me just say a few th few more things. Um, these are slightly more technical slides. I've got three slides to go before I finish up here. Uh, the first slide, uh, coming back to uh, the survey results, um, I'm showing you here some um, some analysis of the um, factors that predict optimism uh, that EBM will be implemented effectively. So, um, so this is uh, an OLS regression, uh, stepwise regression, which is identifying the key predictors of optimism that EBM will be implemented. And you can see in the pre-dialogue uh, data, so on the left here, you can see there's one key predictor, right? So what predicts people's optimism? It has to do with um, the statement, although EBM is a good idea, I'm dubious about the intentions of EBM practitioners. So this is a kind of a value statement, right? Um, I don't think my values are in line with um, the EBM practitioners, therefore I'm, I'm not optimistic, right? There's a negative coefficient there and significant. If you move to post-dialogue, uh, we really see much more procedural statements that predict optimism. So the post-dialogue context suggests that, you know, people are optimistic if they feel that their voice is heard when they speak up about EBM related issues. Um, and people are more optimistic if they understand how decisions are made. Um, so we find that pretty interesting um, because one of the things we were trying to suggest in the dialogue session is that EBM really is a process as much as it, it is a set of outcomes. And these are, you know, these are very procedural variables that are predicting optimism that EBM will be implemented effectively. Uh, so that's one um, interesting change from 
the pre-dialogue to the post-dialogue survey. And then another slightly similar analysis looking at um, likelihood to recommend EVM. So back to that 10 point scale on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend EVM? We can see here in the pre-dialogue, um, the statement uh, in general, people involved with EVM seem like good people, right? So my affiliation with people, you know, if they seem, if they seem like good people, I trust those people. That's a big predictor of like, of your likelihood to recommend EVM. And if you shift over to the post dialogue, you can see that the the effect uh, strengthens, right? The standardized beta goes to 0.53, which shows that even more so after the post after the dialogue, people feel that you know um, if there's an affinity, right? If there's a strong connection to the people involved, uh, they feel like good people to you. Then you're more likely. So that's not a surprising outcome. The other predictor in the post dialogue is just familiarity, right? Familiarity with concepts and practices um, makes people more likely to recommend EBM within the province. Okay, one final slide uh, on the data before I finish things up. Um, you can see here uh, a shift in the level of trust from pre to post dialogue. So these are just um, bivariate correlations um, and you can, this is trust for, uh, in this case, uh, these organizations and their trust in these organizations on the top. Uh, so I've circled uh, the coefficient negative 0.362, which shows that in the pre-dialogue survey, uh, there was a negative uh, level of trust between the forest industry and environmental organizations. Uh, not surprising. Uh, in the post dialogue, we can see that this negative relationship disappears, right? So the level of trust um, was still negative, but now no longer significant, right? So it's softened uh, to some extent. So can people change in a day? Well, maybe. Maybe there's some indication that through some meaningful conversations, there can be a shift in this way. You can also see that it doesn't always go in positive directions. So um, the energy industry and Alberta Parks, very positive in the pre-dialogue, uh, not quite as positive in the post-dialogue. Um, so these levels of trust are shifting to some extent uh, based on the dialogues that are going on um, in the room. So uh, that's something to think about um, as we move through um, our analysis of these data. So let me just uh, finish up very quickly with some summary comments. Uh, here we've got uh, a sense that history really plays a role uh, in how people are ex experiencing and responding to each other. Um, conversations were really not about the technical differences. Uh, what we observed was some negative history between stakeholders and mistrust as key barriers uh, between uh, some of the key stakeholders. Uh, we also observed that there's quite a lot of diversity around the views of what exactly EBM means in practice. Uh, with regard to um, philosophical differences, um, this, the, the, the concepts of sustainable forest management and this focus on values-based forest management um, is really pervasive and often runs um, counter to a lot of EBM thinking and where people really want to push this conversation uh, in the future. Uh, education, uh, we are reluctant to, to, to suggest that, you know, we, we just need to sort of teach people or tell them what to think. Um, that kind of knowledge deficit approach um, has been shown to not be very effective, um, but it does appear that there's some need for sort of general learning around technical kinds of issues that would help um, this conversation move forward uh, more effectively. Um, hopefully the EBM workshop uh, later in June will, will really help with that to some extent. And then trust building, um, just a general comment about the dialogue. Um, the, the approach that Jules LaBeouf organized for us and the fishbowl uh, technique really did seem to be very well received. And we hope that this could be a model or a technique that could be applied in other settings around resource management issues in the province. 
So with that, I think I'll finish, uh, say thank you, um, and show you a, a photograph that I took just uh, last week or two weeks ago in the Waterton Lakes area. So uh, appreciate your time and attention and uh, look forward to responding to any questions that you might have.